Okay. So, hello, it's nice to meet you. It's good to meet you too, finally. Mm -hmm. To start off with, would you just like to say your name and where you are? Sure. My name is Suzanne Slyman, and I'm in Oakland, California, in the United States. Okay. And the first real question is, who are you as a human being? And that can be your passions, qualities about yourself, some values that you hold, or whatever you'd like to share. Well, that's a very big question, isn't it? Um, who am I? Um, well, I'll tell you, I have a number of hats. I'm a, a wife. I'm the mother of a Shih Tzu, who, who is my co-therapist a lot of the time, but not, not, not right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, I am an aunt and I am very blessed, I would say, to have three of my um, nieces and then three grandnephews here locally, who my husband and I spend a lot of time with. So, although I only had Shih Tzus, not children, not people, children, I feel like I really lucked out because I ended up with um, lots of little kids in my life. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I am, um, I've been on a fairly serious spiritual path most of my life, even though it's morphed and taken different shapes over the years. And I am a psychotherapist and I really love doing this work. It's my third career. I started out as a French teacher and <laughs> then I, um, got interested in computers. This is like back in the middle 60s when computers were pretty new, at least mm -hmm. that um, that were being used in business and that kind of applications. And I did that because it, I wanted something other than teaching. I've been the oldest of five children I had been a teacher and I thought, I wanna see what the grown up world is like. So at that time, the field of computers was very wide open. You know, anybody who did well on a basic aptitude test could get a job. So I did that for eight years until it was very clear to me that that was not my path. It was. I was starting to dream in numbers falling down on my head. Oh, no. <laughs> Sitting in front of cordons. <laughs> and that just began a search and looking for um, like, what, are, what do I like doing? And by that time, because of all those numbers falling down on my head, I had started therapy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think lucked out because my very first therapist was a good short therapist. And I, it, it felt very, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. I'm at a loss for words, but it felt right to me. You know, it made sense. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I started doing volunteer work around at the Berkeley Free Clinic and the Crisis Intervention and the Women's Health Collective in Berkeley. And I just fell in love with that work. And so that was, I think, 45 years ago. That long-term relationship now. Then. It's been a long-term relationship, yeah. And 
Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, but yeah, kind of I'm, so I, I'm curious still about passions and values that kind of run through those different aspects of your life. Okay. Um, You know, more than anything else, I, I value presence. And I, um, I think one of the things that actually appealed to me in my introductions to Gestalt therapy was that it seemed like a therapy that also valued that, that um, so maybe we'll say more about that later, but that, that, you know, and in terms of passions, the question, um, I like people. <laughs> Seems like you probably picked the right path then, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully it's been a long time if it's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should have had a sign by now, right? I should have. Yeah. So I'm also interested a little bit about where you come from and specifically what comes to mind as an event or as a set of circumstances from some part of your life that you would say has really shaped you. Mm -hmm. Good question. I have to think about that a little bit. I I think um, I think being the oldest of five kids <laughs> shaped me a lot. You know, um, it helped. It helped me be flexible. It it um, gave me a lot of opportunities to um, Well, I don't know where that sentence is going, but but I think that um, I think that shaped me. I think being, although we didn't think about it this way at the time, being certainly mixed cultural. My dad's family emigrated from the Middle East, mm -hmm. and. My mom's family was D-A-R, uh, Anglo, <laughs> Daughters okay. of the American Revolution. They'd been in this country forever. Oh, okay. And they were, they were definitely very white. Mm. And I grew up in a neighborhood where no, there weren't, as far as I know, any other kids with that kind of mixed background. So I grew up saying, I'm not this, I'm not that. Are you Italian? No, I'm not Italian. Are you Greek? No, I'm not a Greek. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. are you black? No, I'm not black. So um, I, I would say that shaped me. It, um, maybe more than anything else, I think. I, I think people projected a lot onto me positive and negative. I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this, but but I grew up in a neighborhood where me and my brothers and sisters were often called nigger. Um, so no, I'm not that. <laughs> no. But um, But also, as I got branched out and went away to college, people projected exotic. Mm. 
And that didn't fit for me either. I mean, I just felt like it was a normal kid from Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, a, a little too short at that time, a little too chubby, um, a little too dark, a little too light. <laughs> um, so that, anyway. Yeah, it sounds like being a little bit different. A little bit different, yeah. Hmm. Okay. And I'm also wondering who you've met in your life, who you would say has had a significant impact on you. Mm. Well, do I have to name just one person or can I? Yeah, there can be a few. Okay. Just... So I think the first person I met who had a significant impact on me was a woman named Ruth Turrell. She was our minister's wife. We grew up in the Methodist church. And, and um, I think to this day, I, I, it's not conscious, but I think I'm replicating her hairstyle. <laughs> Okay. She also, um, I, I can't believe I remember this, but I remember her saying that a complete meal would be that it was very inexpensive was bananas, peanut butter, and bread, banana and honey. Mm -hmm. So however many years later, that stuck with me. But she she was uh, she she actually was a psychologist, and she just had a wonderful wonderful presence. Mm -hmm. So she had a big impact on me. My high school Sunday school teacher, um, Mary Maxwell, also had a big impact on me. And. After that, and how so? With how did she? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I was very shy, and my Sunday school class was filled with the most popular kids in my high school, mm. <laughs> including her daughter, oh. and and she. Um, This is sort of a strange thing, but but she gave me a, a necklace and acknowledged me as the senior girl in the class, senior high school, I mean, a senior in high school, graduating girl in the class, mm -hmm. who was exemplary. I'm not sure that was true, but it was something about um, feeling a belonging, a stat, a, you know, inclusive, included. Mm -hmm. And so like that. It's remarkable how many people, when I ask this, go back to the first person who they've felt seen by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, after that, it was an, an art teacher in college. I'm not sure what about him, but uh, probably some of that quality. Of, he encouraged me actually to switch majors out of elementary education into art, which probably I should have done, but I did not do. It wasn't practical. So I... <laughs> I, I was thinking ahead, you know, mm -hmm. I, have, I have to graduate as an undergrad from an undergraduate program and get a job and make a living. <laughs> so artists, mm. not so much mm. do that. Um, so that and I don't know. Do you want me to keep going with this list? No, no, that's okay. I, I yeah. imagine we'll start running into Gestalt 
people well, sooner or later. I, that, that was who, that's who's next on my list. Mm -hmm. Who was that? So, that was Cindy Sheldon. Oh, okay. And I met her because my then boyfriend dragged us to couples counseling with her. And um, I, I thought she was amazing. You know, I just kind of fell in love with her. And Cindy, um, Cindy's the, the person who invited me into the Gestalt Institute in San Francisco. And she also invited me into a group of not all therapists, but Marin County growth, spiritual mm -hmm. growth people. And it, um, it felt like the beginning of permission to include spirit with psychotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, at, both from, from Cindy and also from somebody named Richard Olney, mm -hmm. who did something called, he called self-acceptance training that blended gestalt, bioenergetics, and Ericksonian hypnosis and um, Buddhism, hmm. at least that, that was how I understood hmm. what he was talking about, so. Well, I would like to ask more about that. Um, and I would also like to know sort of where you are right now in your life, especially with your experience of age and aging. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, where I am right now, I'm, I'm 78. I will be 79 in about five and a half months, <laughs> six months, six months actually. And I have, um, for the first time started to have a feeling of, oh, Things have a beginning and they have. <laughs> You've noticed that. I've noticed that. I I um, I've been really fortunate. I've I've been very healthy. And um, I've been able to stay very active. You know, mm -hmm. I I walk, and my husband and I hike. You know, six to eight miles without blinking an eyelash it's it's I, I've been very fortunate hmm. actually in, in that regard um, but I'm noticing a couple more aches and pains it, and as, as happen, happens I think and um, but but more than that I've started realizing that this journey on this planet has a beginning and it has an end. And for the first time, I'm starting to think, well, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. And, and what do I want to be doing hmm. with my time? And so up until now, I have never questioned how I spend my time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I mean, maybe I, no, I would say I, I never questioned it. It was just like, of course, this is what I'm doing. And, you know, there were times when I would see 45 clients a week. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like, I love this. Why shouldn't I spend all of my time doing this? And that's becoming less true in terms of the amount of time. Um, I, 
I've, I've never had any impulse to write. I still don't. <laughs> I always thought I should, <laughs> but I don't. Um, I've, I've had a lot of opportunity to travel, which in the last year and a half has been. You yeah, know, that's kind it, of dried up. It's totally dried up. But for years and years and years, I went to India twice a year. Hmm. And um, which I loved. I loved and I, and I, I love India, the, the chaos of India. Hmm or the apparent chaos of India is astounding. <laughs> and but people went to India to look for peace, not chaos. <laughs> well, there's a relationship, I think. For sure. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing that I learned when the first time I went to India was um, I think Lao Tzu said this, who's not from India, but I think he said, the way is easy for the one who has no preferences. Mm. <laughs> it's, um, there is no place like India to teach you that lesson, you know. If, if you put your feet down there and you expect things to go in any way, the way things ordinarily go. It can be miserable. Hmm. It's too hot, it's too crowded, it's too dusty, it's, you know. It's just the way so it is. Poverty, it, it's, it's just the way it is, and it's, it's beautiful. Hmm. Okay. Anyway. So, yeah, no, that's fine. I am, I'm also wondering how you have come in these 78 and a half years to understand and experience yourself within your gender or as a woman? Mm. That's a good question. Well, I skipped having children. So I had a friend once mm. who had a, a t-shirt. Uh, it's an old gestalt therapist. Frank Rubenfeld, uh, at his 50th birthday party, he had a t-shirt that said, I can't believe I forgot to have children. <laughs> now, a few months later, he and his wife, Mary Krieger, were pregnant. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he made up for that. <laughs> they made up for that. But, um, I, I have never thought that much about gender, I think. You know, I, um, that probably sounds weird. Maybe it's just because people weren't talking about those things when I was impressionable. You know, you're a girl or you're a boy. But um, I feel there are a lot of ways that I have a fairly strong masculine um, in um, sort of traditional ways of, of um, well, I don't even know how to put it in words, I would, but I would say it's a, it's a kind of, of, of I like being out in the world. I, I like earning my own money. I like, um, in, in the 60s, which was the beginning of the, that iteration of the women's movement, I remember thinking, if men are allowed to do it, I'm allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. And, that's that. And I, and I think that, um, so I never had a strong urge to have children, but 
I'm pretty nurturing, I think. Um, I have nieces and nephews, and I, I used to be an advisor for a group of young adults, the women. And, you know, I, I, I easily feel like I step into that role. Um, it's a little cheating because I'm not really responsible in <laughs> the same way a parent is totally cheating. Actually, it's not just a little cheating. <laughs> but, but anyway, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I have access to both. Okay. So the last sort of more personal question that I would ask you is really how you experience and understand power and privilege in your life. Really good question. I Well, you know, like going back to what I said about when I was growing up and being mm -hmm. in essentially a mixed race family, um, I experienced um, being shut out from things that the other girls got easily, just like dating, mm -hmm. for example. Um, until I got away to college where it was a little bit more sophisticated. Um, that's, a, that's, I mean, that's a very kind of personal. Where it was sophisticated is another way of saying less racist. Um, more, my, my high school had probably five African-Americans, mm -hmm. mostly uh, very Anglo kids. Um, so when I went away to college, all of a sudden, there were a lot more people who looked like me. Mm. Like that. Mm -hmm. um, but Privilege, I, I am aware of privilege every time I take a walk in my neighborhood. I live in Oakland. Mm -hmm. You don't have to walk very far, just a couple of few blocks. And um, the neighborhoods change. There are fewer trees. There um, are um, older cars. Um, there are more apartment buildings. So every time I go out my door, I'm, I'm aware of, of that. Um, you asked me about race and privilege or power and privilege. Power and privilege. Um, and sometimes power comes up sort of as having and not having and what you do with what you have. Right, right. Um, Well, I mean, this is a little bit of a, 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 a transference take on power, but as a therapist, mm -hmm. I think we have incredible power over the people who come to see us. Mm. And if we're not aware of that, I think we do a lot of damage. Mm. Um, so what do you do with that power? Well, I try to be aware. <laughs> try to be aware. Um, I try, 
I try not to recommend peanut butter, banana, <laughs> and <laughs> honey sandwiches. I, I mean, I think one of the things about Gestalt that always has appealed to me is, is, and it's it's a, a concept of, that comes out of Adhikari also, which is drawing out from within. Mm -hmm. um, and as a so as a therapist, if I'm paying attention to what I'm doing, I'm always remembering that that I don't have the answers. It's that the answers are within that person. They may not have access to those answers, but then if I have a job, it's my job is to help that person access that. Um, I don't know, is that responding to yeah, your yeah, question? Yeah, sure. that's, that's for sure. Yeah. So you come back a little bit to Gestalt at this point. So I mm -hmm. am curious if you would like to say more about how uh, you came into Gestalt and what you found there. Sure. Well, um, when I started therapy, I think unless the person was an analyst, they were a Gestalt therapist, <laughs> at least in, in the, the Berkeley, Oakland, the Bay Area. Yeah, <laughs> yeah your sample may be a bit skewed, but <laughs> yeah, yeah quite skewed. Uh, maybe maybe uh, what was the, the, um, the one that was um, parent child uh, transactional analysis, maybe mm -hmm. another thing that we found here. But so, but I felt I feel like when I got interested in that kind of look into inner work, I was just swimming in the ocean of lot, lots of Gestalt influenced therapists. And uh, as, as I said before, I kind of really came into that with Cindy where um, I, uh, I didn't even, you know, I didn't think of her as a, this kind of therapist or that. I just thought of her as a, a real person. And so, And, and early on, you know, some of the techniques of Gestalt, like the chair, chair work, empty chair work, they're so accessible. And anybody can kind of learn to do them, but people don't always learn to do them um, kindly or usefully. <laughs> In the appropriate context. In the appropriate context, yeah. right. Um, but little by little, you know, I, I think I first got to know Gestalt as a, an expressive therapy. Mm -hmm. And then later mm -hmm. on, I got mm -hmm. to know it as a therapy that um, requires the ability to stay present. Mm -hmm. That just pure expression is actually not therapy. <laughs> mm. It's it's um, because a person can learn to blow off steam over and over and over and over or crumble in tears over and over and over and over. And there's a discharge, but there is no change. Mm. So, um, So I, how did you find presence? How did I find a presence? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in a lot of different 
I think I, I just ran into a lot of different influences like meditation. I got interested in Vipassana, um, Zen, um, where if it's being done authentically, it's all about being able to stay present again in that without judging, without pushing away, without grabbing on to, um, but that, that allowing oneself to be able to stay with an experience. And, and I, I always think of it as holding it in the flame of awareness mm. until it just naturally dissolves and the energy held up or tied up in that uh, is freed in, uh, in a way that allows one to move on in their everyday life. It, it's um, maybe not a completely accurate understanding, but it's my understanding of the paradoxical theory of change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I kind of came to that through meditation, through, in particular, I think, Dick Olney's work, the self-acceptance training that focused so much on that, being able to be with what is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's in every spiritual, authentic spiritual path that I know of that that um, to be able to stay grounded in one's being, that's not to be, to be able to stay grounded in one's being and not at the mercy of one's thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is, um, gives access to, uh, Creativity it gives it access to those those sort of higher level functions of the brain. You know, I think in in recent years that it's been um, talked about a lot in terms of, of polyvagal theory, mm -hmm. how the nervous system functions. I mean, I think these are one of the things I've appreciated about Gestalt is I haven't had to give anything about that up in order to stay current because I think it was founded in, in some basic truths. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the essence of your work or your practice, what you do with Gestalt or around it or in spite of it? <laughs> Um, I would say be um, creating an environment in which I and the person with whom I'm sitting can be present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like one of those questions that my five-year-old asks. He, he knows that, you know, I talk to people, but he's kind of like, yeah, but what do you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> Tell him you invite them to play. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I mean, in a way, that's what it, it, that's what it is. It's like inviting, trying to, creating an environment where I and the other person has the best chance of being present. <laughs> interesting. That's a really interesting description, actually. So how would you say that Gestalt in particular has affected you as a person? Well, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I 
I hope this doesn't sound strange, but it's a theoretical framework that gave me permission to be the therapist I am. I, th I think um, it, you know, I mean, this true confessions, I, I don't especially think of myself as a Gestalt therapist. That's okay. <laughs> I, I think of, of Gestalt being the first therapy I came across, though, mm -hmm. that um, made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like it's kind of in my cells, <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that way of thinking and being. Um, and I don't, I don't know how else to answer that. Maybe no, that's, that's, that's fair. I mean, like you said, without the framework, I mean, maybe it's just me being weird, but if I'm actually doing a thing, which has a framework and even a license that allows me to do it, that's, I know. Yeah. that's very different. You know, one thing that, that this makes me think of, it's not exactly your question, but but there was a point when I thought something Gestalt does not talk very clearly about is transference. Mm -hmm. And I've always been interested in working with um, some people who would be considered to have characterological problems, disorders. And at that point, I started consulting with a woman who was very analytic. And I think we were an experience for one another. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but I remember one time I told her, well, and when this wo woman, one of my clients, was like just completely um, enraged and, and dis disorganized, I stood on my head. <laughs> I have a very flat head and I <laughs> can do that. I That's useful. <laughs> she, said, she said, she said, and the client said, what are you doing? And I said, well, somebody needs to change their perspective in the room. I'm trying to understand what you're telling me. Hmm. And so my, my um, consultant, you know, never forgot that I said that. <laughs> I think that's something that I, I gave her. But what she gave me was a framework to understand um, some of the early developmental wounding that can happen um, that, that creates um, splitting, mm -hmm. um, cr creates um, um, misery. <laughs> um, and I I did. I think the Gestalt was not helping me, even if I believe in presence, it was not helping me help people who were stuck in that way become more present because I I was not understanding the the depth of the wounding. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. So um, how how what we can see as possible is um, determined by the extent to which we um, can access higher levels of reasoning. And, and if we are caught in a trauma state, that's not so easy to do. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. That's... No. Very true. 
And I mean, that to me sounds, um, I often ask what kind of challenges you've run into, especially around practice. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds like some of them. Do any other particular sticking points or challenges come to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very personal thing, but I think one challenge is, I told you about getting that little heart um, from my Sunday school teacher, mm -hmm. but there's a part of me who wants to be loved and recognized. Mm. And so it's a challenge not to have that run the show. Mm. I guess in transference, it, it's a challenge not to be pulling for a positive transference. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with that? Well, I, um, I make more room for people to be angry with me. I make more room for me to be angry or frightened. Um, and to let that be a part of, you know, like, wow, it really scared me when you said that. Or like that. And what about the other side of the challenges? What have been some of those more satisfying experiences for you? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. But, um, I mean, it can be either clinical or personal or uh, favorite stories or uh, just some of those moments that things did go well for you. Okay. Um, well, This is a, things went, one place where things went well for me were, was when I was um, in a leadership role in my spiritual community. And I had been always terrified of speaking in front of people. And um, I think that the I th I I I I got kind of forced into it, and I think that it. It, it just um, forced me to drop my fear of being judged because all of a sudden there I was in front of like several hundred people with a microphone in my hand. And you know, you have two choices. You can pass out. <laughs> I didn't know that was a choice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or or you can surrender. Mm -hmm. And so I had, you know, I had enough experiences like that where I just learned to surrender. Hmm. And when that happens, it's like what, what we were talking about a little bit ago with surrender, it's miraculous, you know, you all of a sudden have access to your creativity, your present, mm -hmm. <laughs> not worrying about what anybody's thinking of you. Mm -hmm. um, you're doing, your, you're just there doing your job. So. <laughs> yeah, just doing a job, but I think it sounds a little bit more like just sort of really being present. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And, and being in that 
and that circumstance being present was the job that I had to do. It was like mm -hmm. to uh, get this this gathering off to a positive good start. <laughs> And what about in the gestalty areas of your life, even if not, if, if that's not like one of the main ways that you define yourself, I'm wondering, you know, if a particular story or an anecdote comes to mind about those experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, just to be clear, when, when I say it's not the way I necessarily define myself, it's, it's not, um, it's, I wouldn't say that I define myself in any of these ways. That's but right. if I if I go back and think about what's foundational, then you know Gestalt is foundational mm -hmm. for me. So I just I wanted to clarify that. Um, so now I need to ask you to repeat your question. No, just just what comes to mind as one of those Gestalt experiences as any mm. part of the any player on the stage i guess you could say mm. but what what comes to mind as something that you have really enjoyed mm. Mm. i have enjoyed knowing other gestalt therapists mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. um, as a bunch mm -hmm. they're creative um they're authentic they are um they like to have fun mm -hmm. um and with the exception of some gestalt therapists getting a little arrogant about mm -hmm. this is gestalt and it's better than everything it's um they're mostly open-minded mm -hmm. you know is any particular moment that you've shared come to mind uh-huh um i mean I, I really like storytelling so yeah i don't know I'm going to disappoint you. I can't think of any particular story. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. It's not a disappointment at all. Yeah. Um, so I was also, I mean, you say Gestalt is foundational to you. So, mm -hmm. so do you consider yourself or would you say you're part of a Gestalt community? Does that mean anything uh, to you? Uh-huh. Um, you know, for a long time, it did. Uh, a very interesting thing happened in in the Gestalt Institute in San Francisco some years ago, quite a few years ago now. I have to tell you, I've been, my husband and I have been cleaning our, out our garage, which has never had cars. And I have found Gestalt um, lists of trainees, gestalt papers that go back, I was gonna say before I was born, but not before I was born, but, <laughs> but, but before I was a, a gestalt. Possibly therapist. before I was. <laughs> Possibly. And I, you know, my sense of community was, so I hadn't gone through that institute, gestalt institute training program. Um, I I really learned Gestalt from um, I was in a feminist Gestalt training with a, a couple of women, um, one of whom had been trained at the institute, mm -hmm. and they they were you know back in the days of Fritz people, mm -hmm. um, and but then uh, the self acceptance training with Dick Almey was probably my, my most foundational training. Mm -hmm. uh, and that wasn't specifically identified with only, gest only Gestalt. Mm -hmm. So um, that was more my community though, with the people I, I got to know in those trainings. And then 
when I was on the faculty at the Gestalt Institute in San Francisco, that became part of my community. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, but I came into it as a trainer, not as a student. Mm -hmm. And so I knew the other trainers and whoever was in the class at the time. So it's a, it's a little bit like I grew up, like I'm not, not quite this, not quite that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit different and that's fine, that's fine. So the last thing that I usually ask is really sort of what's next. Um, I mean, you touched on this on a deeper level, sort of talking about, oh, Maybe there's an end to life at some point. Right. <laughs> um, but I mean, sort of between now and then, do you have anything coming up? <laughs> yeah, um, like what what is next for you? And also what do you think might be next for Gestalt um, in the world we are right now? That's a really good question. Um, What I, I hope is next for Gestalt is um, really good training in Gestalt. And I, um, and when I say really good, I think people train from the experiences they've had and they, um, and they understand Gestalt in terms of, we understand it in terms of who we are. Um, but I would really like to see people carrying that on. I'm not sure who's gonna do that, <laughs> but I, I would like to see that because I, I think it has enormous value what for hmm? value for what in what sense well, i i i think it it has truth in it hmm. you know the one thing i didn't mention was along the way probably 20 25 years ago i got trained in emdr okay and i became a facilitator and and part of that community but the the thing that I could understand how EMDR worked in terms of how I understand Gestalt. Gestalt fits very well with what I consider to be authentic modes of healing. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, I'm sure there are authentic modes of healing I've never heard of, but I'm, I'm just saying in my, my own personal experience. So um, what I hope is that there are younger people carrying that forward um, who are getting broad exposure. Mm -hmm. to ways of understanding Gestalt. I mean, one of the things I liked about the, the San Francisco Institute was that the, the trainers were not all cut out of the same fabric. Mm -hmm. So people really got to, expo they got to be exposed to um, lots of different ways of embodying yeah, I, I loved what you said. I wasn't a student. I came on as faculty. It's like, wow. <laughs> Instead of having to repeat the creed. It's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, I don't know about institutes across the world, but that was part of the nature of the San Francisco Institute. Is that That's an exception, but it's, it's one that I'm quite fond of. Yeah. Hmm. And so what is next for you? What is next for me? Um, I'm trying, I don't know. <laughs> go for I, a hike. I, I mean, for one, huh? Go for, for one, a hike, yeah. I know. No, I mean, one thing that 
is just happening. I, I'm when I decided, oh, I, I, I think I want to be a therapist. It was because I t sat down and said, okay, what do I really enjoy? Mm -hmm. And um, it had a job description. <laughs> Nice. Know, um, or a job title, but but so I've been thinking about that question, um, and so and that that process worked pretty well for me, mm -hmm. and so I what I do know is I'm working fewer hours. Um, I am really enjoying being a a great aunt. Mm -hmm. and a, a, a local grandparent for a couple of delightful kids, even though we're not re biologically related. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do more fun things with my husband. And one of the things is we, we got into, um, he particularly fell in love with Italy. And we've canceled two trips because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But he's dedicated to learning to speak Italian, becoming fluent in Italian. So I'm osmosing a little bit of that. <laughs> um, but, but more than that, I think right now, I'm, I, like we're doing in our garage, I am in the process of clearing unnecessary clutter. Hmm. And I think that's an inner experience as well as an outer one. Um, there are there are a lot of things by this age, <laughs> there are a lot of things I can do. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean I have to do them. And I think I'm, I'm um, sitting with that. So I, can't, I I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm doing right now, though. Is I'm 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 clearing space. I'm weaving my garden. I guess. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, it's it's an interesting level of choice. I mean, I think it does go through stages in life where it's out of all the things that you could do, mm -hmm. it, it becomes a much more selective process. So, yeah. I I know that what I um, what I want is to be more consistently loving um, I have a pretty I think like most people I have a pretty easy time doing that until it's too close to the flame you know so I I um, I'm practicing on my husband. <laughs> Little kids, dogs, they're easy. Clients, mm -hmm. it's easy. <laughs> yeah, they're only there for an hour. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sounds like a lovely practice. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And um, so I guess if I put it in terms of a goal, that's, that's, I, it, it probably sounds uh, kind of, I don't know what it sounds like, but probably I want to be that more and more and more of the time in whatever I'm doing, you know. Sounds pretty nice to me. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So would you say at this point that there's a significant piece of you that I've left out or anything you'd like to add? The, the, the thing that came to mind, which is completely silly, is I love clothes. <laughs> I love, I I love um, 
from the time I was in fourth grade, I would really study. So I got a hundred on spelling. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to take the Friday test. I, w I was done with spelling on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then I could make paper dolls mm -hmm. and design clothes. Wow. <laughs> hmm. So um, it, it's, um, That's it. <laughs> that we haven't funny. talked about that, but yeah. Yeah. no, I specifically didn't bring that up. So yeah. <laughs> I would think of that's, saying that. But I mean that's that's in there. I mean it, it comes through in the art and in the aesthetics and in the creative and yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, even just the way that you're there, it's like there's this gray and then there's a very deliberate choice of whatever you have on. So that's nice. And I, I have a secret. I, I took my my um, sort of adopted granddaughter mm -hmm. hen for a mani pedi yesterday, and I let her choose my fingernail color. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Which determined what I'm wearing today. <laughs> there you go. See, it's it's a relational field influence question. Always, yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. This has been a lovely conversation. Is it okay for you if we leave it here for now? Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you.